Welcome back to Security Weekly. The stories for this week is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And that brings us to our glorious. Stories of the week. Where do we want to begin with the stories I, of the week? I, I don't know. I oh, don't. ooh, let's go hacking with the oldies, Jack, since you're here. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Rob Vanderbrink called his post, except the link's broken in the show notes. Oh. It says hacking with the oldies. It's It was on the ISC blog. That's what – I'm just – Hacking with the oldies. That's right. That's what he called it. It was a dedication to Mr. Jack Daniel. Some new bugs in old code. I think that's been the theme of this year as we talk about stories for the entire year. Isn't that the theme of our entire industry? (laughs) Well, I mean, these are particularly old software bugs, right? I mean, the whole SSL thing and then the whole bash thing. And we've talked about several other ones that are old. The whole Telnet thing we talked about last week. And now we've got a Nifty Bugs in Strings, CVE 2014, 84, 85. Well, this one is priceless, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> Yeah. So what's the problem with string? I, I just I haven't had a chance to really dig into these. I was going to rely on our illustrious I'm, panel to fill it in. I'm sure somebody can fill it in. But, but basically, uh, you think of Strings as just doing search, but... It's not isolated from being able to execute depending on which what you're using. So strings can actually execute what's in the strings that it finds. Ooh, Wonderful. Wow. Yeah, it, and guess what forensics guys right. use? Strings. Yeah, exactly. So th- th- <laughs> <laughs> It's like the world's best reverse engineering tool. Look, look, strings is fabulous, but the fact that this exists, yikes gives you pause significant pause for concern it certainly does and wget has vulnerabilities as well Ugh. yeah sorry that, i, I that's, lost the post please there. continue jack i'm sorry to interrupt oh, that you, was sir. that was uh it was an ancient uh so i it, it takes forever to load but that yeah the isc storm uh isc yeah storm the the diary um Strings bug. Oh, and that's a Michael Zalewski post. So, okay, that would make sense. And then the, the W get, I think uh, HD found that one. If it I'm looks not like mistaken. it. Um, just. Uh, and there's a Metasploit module. Of course. Oh, man. How was he looking for bugs in W get? Kind of interesting. Like, are people saying, I'm just going to go back through these old open source tools and find bugs now? After, um, yeah, well, I mean, after what we've seen in the past year, it seems like a yeah, good idea to, like to just go back and. We just Paul, the more eyes, the more secure it is. That's right. Apparently not the case. <laughs> also, one has to remember a lot of this. A lot of these tools are written in very old C, C++ that has been patch and patch and yeah. monkey patch and chicken I, I, wire and duct tape together t- throughout the years. Oh, oh Carlos, Carlos, you got to go easy on us. I mean, just because it's old doesn't mean it's bad, right? <laughs> no, no, no. It, uh, what I mean is sometimes frameworks change. And when you go like, hey, I have here 10,000 lines of code. And the framework and the libraries have changed. Okay, let me do a refactoring of all of this code. Uh, no, let me just patch where it's failing to compile it. So what's, what's reported in the blog is that uh, Strings uses the old uh, um, an old common library called libbfd. 
uh, which detects executable formats and optimizes the extraction of text by looking at specific sections of the file. Presumably, they're parsing uh, the uh, the ELF format and only pulling out the stuff that's that's interesting, right? The the data section, perhaps the text, um, and um, that, that is the Achilles heel, apparently, as I understand it. Is that is that how you read it, Jack? Yeah. Yep. That's how I read it too. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's unfortunate. Uh, in that, you know, ironically, if strings were simpler, as in just a simple grep for ASCII data, um, it would not necessarily be vulnerable. But the fact it tries to be more intelligent is the uh, the very thing that makes it vulnerable, which is... Uh, I always get in trouble when I try to be intelligent, too, so I, I can sympathize. <laughs> I was about to say, that's many, many things downfall, right? <laughs> things people... You know, you try right. to be more intelligent, and whoops, there it goes, bites you in the, you know what. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Jack, that's did a... you, um, sorry, Joff. Yeah. Oh, no, go yeah. ahead, Paul. I was just going to say, Jack, did you pick up on the FTDI drivers, fake chips update from Microsoft? Yeah, you, just a, a <sighs> little bit more. They. I, I want to hear you guys rant about this, because I read it, I'm like, <laughs> I, wow, I, Jack and Carl's are going to have a Yeah, I, I just, I, it's too bad Larry's not here again this week, because with all the embedded, you know, with the toys, but yes. Uh, so FTDI came out and basically said, yep, uh, we're protecting our intellectual property um, by screwing the end users who have no way of knowing what they've acquired for the most part. Uh, yep. And um, I'll, I'll go out on a limb and there's an event that uh, 1,700 people will be at next week somewhere, shall we say, a few some miles east of Seattle where the the issues with Microsoft patches, uh, breaking stuff are going to come up, and this one absolutely is going to come up with um, how did a Microsoft... The, the deadly thing here is it came through Microsoft Update. Or, so Microsoft pushed out a patch since it was a driver update from FTDI, and FTDI bricked people's gear, but um, Microsoft is the uh, was the vector for this bricking of hardware. Oh wow! Now was this Microsoft or the chip manufacturer? So the code PDI? came. My understanding is the code came from the the driver, the updated driver, came from the hardware manufacturer FTDI, but it was made available as a driver update through Microsoft Update. Yep. So FTDI yep. wrote the code. It was distributed via Microsoft's Update platform. So Microsoft's just a middleman in this case. Yeah, what happened is that they right. gave them the binary blob of the driver. Microsoft has always been getting drivers from them, so they trusted the vendor that the drivers were valid, that there were no issues with the driver. Probably the vendor has already provided in the past official hardware for their testing, so they tested with their official hardware. But once it was deployed, what it did is that anybody who actually had a bootleg co uh Chip. version of this chip in their product. Uh, they detected that and they set the uh, USB ID to all zeros actually breaking the device because Windows cannot detect what type of USB device it is. Now, my question is, does Microsoft just blindly take in these driver updates from these manufacturers with no validation in their code signing their driver updates? <laughs> not, not, not after this one, we hope. <laughs> 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 but, like, what if this driver contains some sort of malware or malicious code in it? it How would Microsoft know? Microsoft, I, I assume, runs everything through their their test harnesses. and Something, yeah. But Microsoft probably isn't. I mean, this is how they get caught on something. You know, they can't have the universal experience, right? There's got to be their edge cases, which is where they tend to get caught out. Um, and this is a driver for hardware that's, you know, they, they may not have you know, hobbyist hardware attached to their their platforms. And it's one of the challenges. It's like a rant for a whole other day that requires, like, people who actually know what they're talking about instead of me. It's one of the challenges of doing all of your regression testing in virtualized environments. Mm -hmm. Not saying Microsoft does, but if you don't have actual hardware with, you know, the, the mix, if you don't have, you know, let's pick on <coughs> Dell, right? If you don't have Dell hardware where no two devices are the same, they're like effing snowflakes until you're into the server hardware. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, you don't, if you're not testing against physical boxes, you're going to miss stuff like this. And physical boxes with, 
you know, weird keyboards attached that have extra crap in them so that they remember things or, you know, keyboards with a docking station for a trackball or, or, you know, those beyond things, the way people actually use computers with with NAS devices or, um, I mean, you know, with a USB or mm. Thunderbolt or whatever hardware attached with weird things attached with odd, odd audio and video drivers, you miss these things. And if you don't have your... Focusrite or PreSonus or M Audio mobile thing, you know, uh, USB device attached. You'll never know that it it's not mm-hmm. compatible. Um, but this is actually going the next step and saying, you know, the the thing is counterfeit. And I mean, how how do even distributors know? I mean, it's all coming out of. I'm assuming either Taiwanese or more likely mm-hmm. Chinese factories. The counterfeit ones could be coming off the same assembly line on a different shift Mm -hmm. and have different uh, signatures on them. I don't know. I'd be curious to see how Microsoft does security testing of signed drivers. Do you guys know? It's it's going to be difficult. As Jack mentions, they're not going to be able to have every single piece of hardware out there for every driver that they actually support since they actually support so many thousands of devices right. out there. That's you know, the advantage of Windows. You can run it with anything. The problem also arises that when I get drivers from a vendor, let's say from Hewlett Packard or from Dell, uh, many times these vendors would actually provide hardware to Microsoft. Hey, here's the hardware for you to test against. So this vendor probably provided to them some serial to USB dongles and said, here's the hardware for you to test the drivers just to make sure that they behave the way that they need. What happened here is that the vendor broke the trust that right. they were assuming by Microsoft, and Microsoft got burned. And yep. my biggest worry is no, not so much about the bricking of the devices, because they're, let, let, let's be honest, they're, yeah, they're yeah. serial to USB dongles. Uh, it's not the end of the world. You can go to Best Buy and buy another mm-hmm. um, f- for ten dollars. Uh, pr- what worries me is the degradation of trust in Windows Update, and what will this that's cost? You know, on that, top of everything else we've had in the past year and a half. That's yep. the real terrifying thing. Um, you know, I mean, I can I can see that if you happen to be caught out in you know, some bizarre processes. And when you say serial to USB, I start thinking about, you know, automated processes, you know, industrial control or, or, you know, I don't know about skaters, but, you know, things where your computer is controlling something uh, and it's designed for a serial interface. So I can see it making people have a bad day, but there are some devices can be recovered. As you said, you can go get another device. Um, But yeah, the the loss of trust in Microsoft. And and Paul, to your point about signing, you know, that's not really a factor because we know where the code came from, right? Yep, it's absolutely FTDI that gave us the shit code. Or I see. So code signing is just validating the, origin, not intent. Right. Correct. Right. Right. So, I mean, you know, you, you, that's what governments and clever bad people do yes. is sign software that does what they want it to do, not necessarily what the user wants it to do. I got gotcha. you. And, so, and also, if you think about it, if Microsoft starts asking every single provider of drivers... Give me your code. I want to audit your code. Yeah, that wouldn't scale. That line is just going to get out of hand. Well, it makes you wonder, should should Microsoft consider splitting the uh, update model where, you know, hey, we're going to run Windows Update, but we're going to run it for our own drivers only and our own operating system. And, they and need- we have a, a secondary thing, you know, that's, that is for our vendor-supplied drivers, which you can opt into or not. You know. They do give you some control, but it's poorly explained. You know what's critical versus what's important and what's optional. It needs to be. I think they need a much more granular and more clearly explained update process that says, you know, I want security updates for Windows that come from Microsoft. Yes, no. I want security updates for Microsoft software other than Windows. That comes from Microsoft. Yes, no. You know, yeah, I exactly. Want there needs to be a, 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 a clear Android distinction. Model. Right, right. right. You yeah, know, you know, really control. down yeah. to, uh, you know, because if you check the optional software, the next thing you know, you're running Silverlight or, God forbid, Link, oh. right? Uh, you know, next thing you know, Link's on your machine. <laughs> I love Holy Carlos's sh- reaction. <laughs> Oh my God! I've because got, I've been rebuilding all and a my Bing bar and a Bing bar. bar. You get a Bing bar. You get a Bing bar. And you still see it in the optional downloads. 
Yeah, oh, you can't. Well, because every time they put a new version of Silverlight and that Microsoft, if you're listening, which you're not, no, never, ever, ever do I want a Bing Bar. A Bing Bar sounds like something <laughs> you go to Dairy Queen and get. Can I get a caramel Bing Bar? Oh, you're out. I'll take a cherry flavored Bing Bar. Um, hey, it's just, hey, Jack, it's like getting an LLC in uh, in, in Delaware, right? <laughs> Can I have that Bing Bar to go? Bing bar. No, I don't want a Bing Bar. I don't want the. And uh, the, the challenge is that uh, I get it. I mean, from fatigue, you're like, oh, fine, just install everything and leave me alone. But then you end up with Silverlight, and then you have Silverlight Vulns. Or you have Link, and shit runs all the time for no apparent reason. And um, I think a uh, uh, an Ubuntu install CD is the only way to uninstall Link from a Windows machine these days. Uh, 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 uh. I think it's easier to take Explorer.exe out of a Windows box than Link these days. You know what? It's I call this the toaster effect, right? Our, our user population look at it as if it's a toaster they want it to make toast they don't care they're just going to say yes next next finished that's it right so with, given that um you know where does this responsibility lie i mean you you either separate it out and make it granular and force people to make the choice or you let them just click next next finished right and it, it appears that the uh the latter uh, is the preferred option right now. Yeah, and one of the things that worries me is that Microsoft has actually pulled patches and reissued them at least in the last four patch cycles that they have gone through. And that is something that really, really, really worries me because what is happening is people out there that are patching stuff. I've seen discussions well the, where they're saying, oh, I used to patch in two days or I used to patch in one day. Now I'm going to wait 30 days. And many times, a lot of these patches are for stuff for attacks that are already happening out there. So now you kind of open a wider window of 30 days that you're exposing yourself because you don't want to set up a test environment or you don't have the resources to do it. But many times it's just that they don't want to go through the work of doing it. So, you know, how many environments truly actually have a test environment, first of all. Um, you know, In fact, some... I've, I've seen some that when they don't have the budget in a couple of government organizations, what they do is that they sell a couple of users inside of the, uh, uh, in their environment and they say, okay, guys, you're going to be my guinea pigs. Uh, do you volunteer? Yes. So you have one lady in a guy in, over here, another guy in IT, another guy in somewhere else. And you push patches to them first. And then for the next two days, you ask, hey, did everything went well? Cool. Or you get a batch of people that use specific Dell model. The other guys are using HP. And you select a couple of users in your group and you have them test those patches first. And you can actually go by without having that big budget. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good hybrid model uh, and a very good point, Carlos. Uh, I, I've seen... I've actually worked in environments that did a very similar thing, and uh, I, I think that's a, a great way to go um, to sort of meet the middle point there, where you can uh, select a subset of your population. and And let's let's face it, in the in the Windows Microsoft world uh, with group policy, that's completely possible to to pull off um, quite effectively. So, um, yeah, good, very, very good point. Symantec released an intelligence report. Things are bad. That's pretty much the. Oh, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, some, Wait, if you oh want, my... it, it, it... <laughs> are we supposed to end on a happy note? I'm just wondering. <laughs> all right, I I can't even do it justice. But as uh, as all of our listeners know, you know there there are uh, there are other security podcasts, and a few of them are good. Um, <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the good ones is uh, our friend Pat Gray's uh, Risky Business podcast, and uh, uh, last week uh, he updated his Macs and had some kind words for Apple. Oh, uh, he had some <laughs> horribly scathing <laughs> words for Apple. <clears throat> but another thing on yep. that show was the guy's story about uh, semantic, uh, completely unrelated to this. 
But they used uh, Semantics uh, Message Labs uh, anti-spam and, and other services, and um, they had another project working with Semantic, which got put on hold. And so since Semantic didn't deliver, their project manager said, don't bother paying the bill since we haven't done it yet. And the accounting people saw that it hadn't been paid. And so they turned off all of their cloud services and broke uh, the global corporate email and said that they had sent them an email. <laughs> and it turned out they had sent emails to five or six people, four or five of which got compl got rejected. And one was filtered by their own spam system and went into the spam bucket rather than being delivered. So they failed at sending it out, um, and they failed at answering, and they just they just semanticed it. I mean, just semantic, semantic. I'm not even going to address this. Yeah, you want to know what's so based on that story? You know what a giant risk on the internet is? Trusting fucking semantic. <laughs> oh, nice. Wow. Can, really, because we turn to you for stability, reliability, and security. And you screw us. Thank you very much. Semantic. And anybody who's surprised oh, yeah. by that behavior has not dealt with semantic before. Jack, is there anything to be said by them stating that there were 600 vulnerabilities disclosed in September, the highest number so far in 2014 and the second highest in 12 months? Is there any? Is there anything interesting we can glean from those numbers? Do we have to look at them over a longer period of time? Is that just because there's more software? Is there more people looking? Is there more of both? Is there more awareness about vulnerabilities? It, is there a higher rate of reporting? Like all those factors yeah, come in, it's and I'm like, like it, how, any, what do I do, do with that Do data? any of them matter? You know, you, all right. So we've got vulnerabilities. See, are these remote code? Are these you know what level There's of skill? Yeah. You know, is is this uh, why they deployed software? Right. Um, Too many variables for me to make usage of that <laughs> statistic for me. Uh, just uh, watching the Twitter feed. It's <laughs> Jared uh, points out, I mentioned Semantic on Security Weekly. The video feed crashes. Coincidence? Um, <laughs> no. Anything <laughs> evil, um, you know, it's it's uh, software. You know, Semantic has taken over from CA is where good software goes to die, although they have competition for that. But, uh, yes, I think that the number, just a raw number, you know, 600, I don't know what that means. Is it? Is it good? Bad? Is it? Is it, what? Do we act upon finding like? finding more vulnerabilities? Is arguably good. Uh, you know, if we looked at fifteen-year-old software, it would. Uh, yeah, is that software even deployed? They're finding vulnerabilities. Right. And there's you know, yet what are they finding? Variable. And what are these vulns? Are these like vulnerabilities um, that require you to be logged in as root or? local admin and you yeah yes yeah, th that's the question that, that so uh, it, by itself it means nothing you know it's exactly. uh, without context without context it's is it, as people I, I don't know if i've talked about it here but I, one of the pictures i use in some of my slide decks is uh, i've got a picture of a uh, old beat up ford pickup truck with a crane in the bed and you can see on the rear bumper you can very clearly see the texas the the pro secession texas bumper sticker on the rusted rear bumper of the truck. And, um, you know, if you assume that that truck is, say, um, outside of Houston, uh, you come to one conclusion. And then when you pull back and you see that it's got a Massachusetts license plate, that context goes from fuck you all, we're leaving, to fuck you and stay out, right? So context matters. <laughs> well, that's the moral picture, of that story. Picture that. <laughs> There's yeah, an the image for you. Don't think to consideration. Right now, there are more developers out there. There's a lot of more software. There's a lot of more people in the security field right now that are seeing uh, cash uh, signs everywhere and going like, hey, I can make money out of this. If I find enough bugs, I sell these bugs. There are more programs out there for uh, that will pay you uh, uh, or give you not notoriety. Uh, they, they will say, hey, make you famous. For finding all of these bugs uh, right now bug hunting before was kind of like a no-no you always yeah, had yeah. to risk it hey i'm gonna report this to these guys and i don't know if they're gonna take it seriously or throw the lawyers at me and right now you have companies actually paying for you to find bugs in their stuff so yes there's going to be uh, a right. larger amount of vulnerabilities found out there there are also <laughs> a lot of more programmers and as we know education is shitty Unsecure code. Yep. 
Yeah. So, so Carlos, I think you have a good point. I mean, I think the, the general noise level is is up right now. I think just because of the um, the combination of a lot of facts, right? The the bug bounty programs for sure. The um, the also the, the even the just the general media interest, right? I mean, we have a lot more um, focus now on what it is um, to be secure as a software product out out there um even in general general public exposure because we've had very we've had this string of very um public uh breaches um th- this year particularly and uh i think that's raising the um visibility level overall and uh, i think it's probably raising the interest level as well so we have a lot more interesting dynamics going on in the industry so um i would come back to saying as jack was saying what is behind the numbers I mean that's the key, you know. Just to put a stat out there and go, well, six hundred of this or six hundred of that, um, not good enough. I mean, you know, what what kind of valid research is behind those kinds? And, of and, and that is why I love the Verizon report because when you go to the Verizon reports that they put year after year, you're going to start seeing that the bugs are always the same old bugs. Like, hey, they stole credentials, reuse credentials, uh, lack of patches in the systems. Yeah, um, and you're going to see a bunch of stuff that, even though we see all of these new vulnerabilities coming out, people are still getting popped using ten-year-old techniques out there, and SQL injection is still the number one. If we're going to go into history lessons, I'm going to hijack for a minute. Tangent, although not really. Um, Everybody, buckle in. Uh, I just so those, I've been doing that. Punch cards I mentioned this like three weeks. Uh, punch cards. You know how? Uh, you know, back in my day when we were uh, fuzzing punch cards, what we do is <laughs> we'd uh, come off the golf course and leave our golf shoes on, and we'd walk over the punch cards and feed them in. And that had fuzz those mainframes, I tell you. Um, <laughs> you used to use a shotgun. Come on, you didn't use golf shoes. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so. In doing the Shoulders of Intosec project, which I talked about a few weeks ago, uh, and it's growing, uh, shout out to uh, Davi Ottenheimer has, has added a bunch of stuff and uh, trying to fill some stuff in. But uh, And also co-worker uh, Ken Bechtel gave me a, a list of a couple dozen uh, early folks in the antivirus world who um, we like to make fun of antivirus these days, but those guys in the early days actually knew what they were doing. Um, they knew how to code at low level. Um, Anyway, so anyway. one of the folks that I highlight in my talks uh, is Bob Abbott, and um, he led uh, something called the Resource Project, Research into Secure Operating Systems. It was a study from like 71 to 75, 76, and the goal was aiding and understanding security issues and OSs, um, and then trying to figure out how hard it was to enhance security. And the end result of this was distilled into seven bullet points. And I want to read them for you now, and I want you, everybody listening to remember this is from 19, a, a project a study that ran 71 to 76. So uh, before most of you were born. Um, yep. yep. Not to make seven bullet old. points. Let's see. The great thing is that 40-something years ago, we've fixed all of these. Number one, incomplete parameter validation. Okay, maybe not all of them. Number two... <laughs> Inconsistent parameter validation. Fixed. <laughs> Number three, implicit sharing of privilege or confidential data. Fixed. Huh. Number four, asynchronous validation and inadequate serialization. Yeah, uh, fixed. Which, you know, for those of you that aren't coders, well, that's uh, our race conditions and time to check versus time to use flaws. Because we totally nailed that. Um, inadequate identification, authentication, and authorization. Oh, yeah, we got that sorted out. Uh, viable prohibitions and limits, and then exploitable logic errors. So, um, in fairness, it just proves it's a lot easier to define the problem than solve it. But looking at these things, it's just like, oh, really? This is how far we've come in 40 years. Awesome. We s- Whatever. <laughs> oh well, well, wait a minute, Jack. You you got to give us all a little bit of a break. It's very hard to work under conditions of a completely moving target, right? I mean, well, that's absolutely true. And one of the things that that has happened between this and the Ware report and a couple of other Anderson report and a couple of other foundational documents is that we went from you know they were really worried about moving from 
single purpose, single user computers to multi user, multi threaded and you know, multi process or multitasking environments. Exactly. And that was the challenge that they were facing. And now what we've done is we've taken this shift, and there are a couple of things that I think are uh, took us from having theoretical possibility to dramatically improve security to we're screwed. Let's pa- let's plug holes as fast as we can. And and there, the the rapid increase in the the multi-purpose uh, computing, uh, the global interconnectivity, and those two things drove the consumerization of computing which drove um, consumerization of computing. So the costs are down to where, even though last week I was making fun of using Windows for Internet of Things, there's a a business case to be made because anybody can write for Windows and you use commodity hardware instead of special stuff. And why on earth would you run QNX on special boards or something when I can just, uh, you know, run Windows code? And the answer is it's probably cheaper short term. And as long as... As long as you're not paying the interest on technical debt, uh, that may be, seem like a good idea until you get ohm 12 ways and you have in, insecure and unsecurable ATMs and uh, more critical systems. But I think there's that transition point to multipurpose computing, global interconnectivity, feeding, con- oh. consumerization, and commoditization. What I was going to say is, you know, back in the day we had those big computers that ran multiple operating systems. Right, and right. Then we fast forward <laughs> to today. Loop. Wait, we have big yeah, computers. We have big, but, uh, yes, there, there is yeah, a bad it's example. The, it's the same, right? It's exactly the same, but yeah. there, there's a lot more of them. Yeah, there's a lot the more. in the hands of a lot more people a, that are not the guys in white absolutely. coats standing behind a, the window taking your punch a, cards. And, and <laughs> yep, I mean, yep, in the old point, days, John. if you wanted to know who was attached, you grabbed each one of the copper wires coming out of something and followed it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. I mean, in some cases, they were going no, a great. really, really long way. Like in the '70s in college, when you were at a community college or, or you know, remote college, and the computer for the university system was. Is at that the when main you went office. to visit your kids in college? <laughs> <laughs> was at the end of a wire. Um, hey, you got my permission. <laughs> Go ahead and smack it. <laughs> Come I on, that I was a good one. I haven't said this in a while, so I'm overdue. You know what? <laughs> You'll be old someday, too, if you're <laughs> lucky. <laughs> Not doing my job unless I deserve that comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I was going to I don't know about Paul, but when I studied, I remember I had to get my time chair on the vax on the mainframe to go with yep. RPG on the vax. Yeah. On the vax. Uh, the NSA has given its blessing under the agency's commercial solutions for classified program, meant that the Samsung Galaxy 4, 5, and Galaxy Note 3 and Note 10.1 2014 edition cleared a number of security stipulations and could be used to protect classified data. However, an unnamed researcher this Thursday published a lengthy report that claims a PIN chosen by the user during the setup of the Knox application is stored in clear text on the device, specifically in a file called, get this, pin.xml. Yep, and later. they found it the day after the NSA gave their blessing. Imagine that. And I thought it was called, get this, XML. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> no I, I, I bet you the NSA went like, oh, Ooh, look at crap. this. Somebody we lost get their the job. Pin. Hmm, let's get everybody to use it. Let's... Let's vouch for it. Yeah, somebody was drinking heavily that night. <laughs> I have to say, WTF. even though I have nothing but the most respect for the people that work at the NSA, uh, the organization itself, uh, we it has a history of not being the watching for the best interests of securing stuff. Uh, so, so. W- w- Especially when they need to get into it later on. So when it comes to stuff that is NSA blessed, I'm skeptical of actually using it. There is an article in there, three ways to make your Gmail account safer. Correct me if I'm wrong. Don't use it. The Google (coughs) Google two-factor authentication, the heck do they call that? Um, Google Authenticator. Google Authenticator. Yep. That does not work if you're accessing via uh, IMAP, correct?
correct? Uh, you uh, can actually create uh, an app-specific password so you right. can use it with your email client. In fact, I use it for my personal account and for my Google Apps account. I actually use uh, so, but the, two-factor but that, auth. You can't use two-factor over IMAP. Uh, not over IMAP. I okay. create a specific application password for it's IMAP separate, and yeah. another specific application password for ADM on my Mac. And I select to what it can have access to. So in the case of IMAP, only the emails and contacts. Oh, I see. So you limit your risk. Oh, that's good. It's still yep. not two-factor, but better than what I thought. Yeah, yep. exactly, Paul. I was mm. going to say, uh, Carlos is right on the money. I mean, it's 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 an unfortunate reality that, that two-factor doesn't work with protocols like that. So they had to do a workaround. However, as Carlos is pointing out, you do limit the risk and you ca can create numerous application specific keys uh to to kind of spread that risk out a little so it's it's um it's not as bad as you think mm. cool well anyway that article's out there make some other pretty good i guess good recommendations to enable two factor uh enable those recovery alerts um i like the idea of creating limiting your risk as carlos uh said and of course, it tells you when other people um, log in as your account, which is which is not bad either. And, and, I'm just concerned and, and, about the two factors. In my case, once you have protocols. enough pins, that when you open Google Authenticator, you actually have to scroll up or down. Yeah. Um, do you know that you're kind of paranoid? Yes. I have them for LastPass, for GitHub, for Dropbox, for uh, for my Windows uh, Live account. For my Gmail, for my Google Apps, for uh, my tenable appliances. Uh, quite a bit. Have you seen that? No. Uh, nope. <laughs> yeah. If you uh, tenable appliance uh, password recovery can be sucked into uh, your Google Authenticator now, having just set up uh, some new appliances in the lab. But oh, yeah, nice. I know what you mean. You know, my my domain registrar uh, Gandhi supports uh, Authenticator apps, so. Uh, In fact, we're getting one strange have hands. We're getting, we're getting, I think icon. we're playing baseball because the catcher is making signs. To the they pitch. were. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, closing stories? Uh, as, as often as the case, there are a bunch of good stories, so take a look through them. Uh, some interesting stuff. Um, what, was, what was there? Job? Rob Graham has some good stuff. As always. Drupal, you're screwed. Drupal, you're screwed. Uh, yeah, there's a post on RDP Replay that Carlos actually tipped me off to, so I threw in my stories. Uh, we didn't talk about mobile carriers tracking you and Twitter using that to do bad things, but you go ahead. And our buddy Anton Chuvakin asks how much you trust your managed security service provider and how much should you, which is, of course, a good question. So that's a yeah, quick rundown. The, the mobile one was uh, particularly Verizon, I think, is, is throwing a cookie onto your web traffic and tracking you and using it for yep. targeting and advertising and so forth. Uh, which is kind of sad, and there's no way you can opt out. Thank right. you very much, mobile. Right. So that's Gregor, HTTP so. and that's HTTP inject. Ken White, I think somebody else has, but Ken White's got a uh, a simple tool. Um, it's linked in the stories there, and it's not just Verizon. They were the first ones that was proven, but I believe T-Mobile's been said to be doing the same thing, and AT&T is, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, Uh, pretty straightforward test at lessonslearned.org forward slash sniff. If the broadcast UID is not blank, somebody's screwing with you. Um, anyway, so a lot of folks are doing it, and it's it's probably going to continue to be done because there's good money in it, and there won't be enough of us paranoid people who complain. So HTTPS or tunnel out through your whatever so that uh, you get past your carrier. Yeah, it's uh, that that one's uh, a little bit disturbing in 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 my mind, and uh, those kinds of practices I think need to stop. Yep, yep. Uh... The problem with the Verizon one is that I actually heard someone that I won't mention from another company actually say, "Oh, that's cool. I should actually start using that." Uh, yeah, very sad. Okay, that's my closing comments. Excellent. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and wrap up the show.
Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this edition of Paul's Security Weekly. Our wonderful mixologist, Mr. Jack Daniel, is in here in studio keeping us happy for the show. Joff and Carlos, thank you very much. Chris Crowley, thanks for stopping by. He had to go to a parade, so it's awesome. Happy Halloween, everyone, and we will see everyone next week for Paul's Security Weekly. Jack, take us out. Over and... Out, out, that's it. Is that a senior moment, Jack? That was a senior (laughs) moment.